Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, and it's good to see you in the chair. Um, tonight, I'm going to actually have one positive and lots of things that are just terrifying. So let's have some fun with some math. Um, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, we often start with this board just because it helps everyone sort of visualize what we're talking about. And we're going to fixate. A couple weeks ago, I actually beat up on some of the Republican ideas in regards to where the debt was coming from. Tonight, I'm going to beat up on some of my brothers and sisters on the left on tax proposals and how little they actually do. But first, let's get an understanding of how bad, how difficult, how terrifying. If you are not terrified right now on what's going on with U.S. debt, you don't own a calculator. So look, this, uh, I've used this board for years. It's actually the 22 board, but the concept is real simple. You see this blue? You see the green? That's all we vote on. This wedge right here, that's all we get to vote on. That's what we call discretionary. The red is mandatory. That's Medicare, that's Medicaid, that's Social Security. Those are the things that are on a formula. You get those because you worked a certain number of quarters. You get those because you turned a certain age. You're part of a certain tribal group. Or um, you fall below a certain income. These are formula driven. This wedge over here, defense and non-defense discretionary, when we were here a couple weeks ago, our math said every dime of that discretionary, defense included, was going to be on borrowed money this year. Um, we, the Supreme Court made its ruling in regards to student loan debt. That backs off two, three hundred billion dollars of spending this year, we're having to redo the interest calculations. Because if you've all watched what happened in interest over the last 10 days, and then there's the discussion of what we call paying back the extraordinary measures. When we were having the battle over the debt ceiling, one of the ways they kept the government running is they borrowed from all sorts of trust funds. Well, now they have to sell lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of debt. That's actually how you saw the thing where we borrowed a trillion dollars in like a week. That was actually selling bonds to functionally pay back those extraordinary measures. And I'm going to show some charts on that. But those bonds are now at the much higher interest rates. Haven't had the time to actually do those calculations. So the good news I'm going to show in a chart is we may not borrow 1.8 trillion this year. It could be 1.5, 1.6. I'm a little more um, dour. I think it's going to be closer to 1.7. But we haven't done all that. But the point of the matter is, give or take a couple hundred billion dollars, all discretionary is pretty much borrowed this year. Think about that. So if you're part of the brain trust that walks in, this is me beating up on, on myself and some of my friends, you walk in and say, we can balance the budget by getting rid of foreign aid. A couple weeks ago, I showed the chart. That's like 12 days of borrowing. The last 12 months, anyone want to guess? Let's play a game. In your head right now, last 12 months, how much have we been borrowing per second? What's the burn rate? What's the borrowing rate last 12 months? Not the fiscal year, the last running calendar 12 months. What have we been borrowing per second? If you said $63,000 a second in your head, you're really good at math. Because in the last 12 months, we've borrowed $2 trillion. It's over $63,000 every second. The delusion that debt doesn't matter, maybe it doesn't matter until it does. And when it does, it's the poor, it's the working middle class that are going to get their heads kicked in. It is immoral what's going on here. In what is it, nine years when the Social Security Trust Fund is empty, and I'm going to show the trust funds in a little bit, and grandma takes a 25% cut in her Social Security check. And we double senior poverty. That's moral. But once again, you've heard me gripe about that. When the president stood behind that podium and made it toxic to have an honest conversation of the trust funds being empty. Remember, the Social Security Trust Fund will be empty this 10-year window. The transportation, the Highway Transportation Trust Fund, is empty in just a couple more years. The Medicare 
trust fund is empty. How many times today did you see people get behind these microphones and talk about the math? Last week, when we were at home, I had a great conversation with a reporter from one of the big cable news networks. And she had all sorts of questions, but they were personality. You know, who's fighting with who, who doesn't like who. And I stopped her and said, do you realize how much of this year of all discretionary is borrowed? And she said, yes, David, I watched part of your speech the other day. And understand, none of my national audience cares. My producers don't care. Dear Lord, I hope that's not true. Because it's the single thing that wipes out a republic. Look what's happened over history. The debt is what destroys you. Maybe that's why we're terrified to talk about it. So once again, why this was important is a year ago, so let's go back, way back, like a year ago May. This year we were supposed to only borrow about $900 and $80 billion only. As of two weeks ago, our best math, because remember, healthcare costs had gone up dramatically. I think our math was in the first seven months of this fiscal year had gone up, just Medicare had gone up 16%. Interest costs had gone up 130 billion, and now continue, because we're even at higher interest rates than that previous calculation. And tax receipts had fallen like 10% substantially because capital gain taxes. I mean, who's gonna sell an asset when most of your gain is inflation? And, and there's historic precedence that, that during times of high inflation, people stop selling things because you're gonna get taxed on, not gain, but inflation. We were calculating that this year's borrowing was gonna be about 1.8 trillion. Now with the Supreme Court ruling on student debt, take away two, 300 billion from that, so that's the good news. The terrifying news, once again, still is almost all of discretionary spending is on borrowed money. So let's have some more fun with math. It doesn't really change some of the outside economist's calculation from about three weeks ago. So CBO basically said, hey, guys, well, you did the debt ceiling deal. You probably pulled down debt to GDP by about four points. Remember, we were seeing things we were going to be in the end of the 10-year window, nine budget years from now, at about 119% of debt to GDP. Remember, that's publicly held debt. Um, let's make this point. When you see the number, it says there's a, you know, a $32.5 trillion of debt. A few trillion of that is actually money we borrow from ourselves. It's, this is the money that's in the healthcare trust fund. This is the money that's set aside for future benefits for veterans. We internally borrow that. Now, we still pay interest on it. Like when the Treasury borrows money from the Social Security trust fund, we pay interest. Matter of fact, for years, it was actually a spiff. They actually got a little higher than market interest rates. So there's two plus trillion dollars in Social Security trust fund. And we're going to burn through that in about eight and a half, nine years. But for that remaining 25, 26 trillion dollars of borrowing, that's where we're at today. CBO now updates the number saying, hey, you made the debt ceiling deal. You're basically going to remove about $100 billion of spending for the next few years on discretionary. So instead of spend, spending $700 billion, you're going to spend $600 billion. That brought us down to 115% of debt to GDP. But then Moody's did their calculation in saying, well, with higher interest rates, higher health care costs, and we believe flat GDP growth, we think at the end of the 10 years, you're going to be at 120% of debt to GDP. Why that's a big deal is that's higher than during World War II. The one that terrified me was Bloomberg Intelligence they actually have a fairly sophisticated data model, like Tax Foundation, like Joint um, uh, Tax, others here, CBO has one. The Bloomberg model said, nah, you're going to like $52 trillion of borrowed money, 130% of debt to GDP at the end of the 10-year window. If this is true, please, I desperately hope Bloomberg intelligence isn't true, but if you read their notes, 
it makes sense. And there's a couple things I want to throw out why their notes make sense. That's in 10 years we're spending about $2 trillion a year in interest. Remember, CBO today, well, actually, last week, put out their long-term estimates. Their long-term estimates have, because I know we all grabbed it and read it last week when it came out. Remember the little booklet? It's percentages of GDP to debt, but in there are some line items. What's the borrowing? What's the interest cost next year? CBO, which has been far too conservative on some of these numbers for the last decade. But what did CBO say we're going to spend in interest next year? Three quarters of a trillion dollars next year. My math for this year was about 620, 630. We have one economist with us that says it could be 680, depending on the cost of this recent financing. But what was fascinating is something those who, is, who care about the honest math don't talk about is in the notes from Bloomberg Intelligence. They said, hey, guys, you really, really, really need to cut spending. Okay, but do understand, it's not a free option anymore. So when Bloomberg Analytics came back and said you're going to be at 51 plus trillion dollars of borrowed money at the 10 years, 130% of debt to GDP, think of this. Just the removal of that $100 billion of spending, got to do, going to pay interest on it and those things, but that's going to lower GDP next year by half a point. So one of the things that goes on here is we're going to cut this, fine, we need to reduce spending, but don't think it's a free option that the GDP continues to grow because you just removed $100 billion of spending out of the economy. Now you got to do it, but it, when you do it, you also have to adopt other policies that grow. And there's the thing that frustrates me so much around here. It's we're incapable of thinking complex answers for complex problems. It's not just cut, you gotta have policies over here grow, promote investment, promote risk taking. You don't get to just do one without the other. It's just sort of like when the left a couple of years ago did, hey, we're gonna spend 1.9 trillion and then they didn't think through, and we're gonna pay people not to have to work. The economists, even Democrat economists, were losing their mind. If you're gonna put out that sort of stimulus, you gotta be actually making stuff to sop it up. And then they wonder why you set off inflation. So let's actually walk through a little bit more of this. This is a new board for us, and I'm just trying to point out a very simple concept, and I've done entire presentations on this. Look at the last 50 years of history. When we've had very high marginal tax rates, we get about 18 19% .5, of the economy in in taxes. When we've had very low marginal tax rates, we get about 18 .5, 19% of the economy in taxes. You see something? The tax receipts actually are sympathetic excuse me, not sympathetic to the tax rate. They first sort of fall into this mean. So the concept is grow the economy as much as possible, and you actually, as the bigger the economy, that percentage represents more dollars. But when you start to look at this chart, this black line is revenues, the proper term is receipts, and you'll notice if you can run a line, it's always right there about that 18 half, 19 percent. But you see the color lines here? Just this green here, it's just borrowing. And why this is a big deal. You remember a moment ago, I was starting to show you that Bloomberg and some of the others, CBO was saying, hey, you probably, you may get as high as seven, seven and a half percent of the entire economy in borrowing. And Bloomberg comes in and says, no, it could be as high as 13% of the economy in borrowing in at the end of the 10 years. Okay. Let's say CBO's right at seven, and your economy is now growing at 1.7, 1.8. The difference between 1.8 and that seven, seven and a half, and God forbid it's not Bloomberg's 13, that difference is what buries you. And yet, we have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of history of when we've raised taxes, 
you get a little pop of receipts and then it fades back down because as a percentage of the economy, the economy doesn't grow. So let's walk through a couple more things. Interest spending is now a key thing in driving parts of the debt. I'm going to show a couple boards here showing it's spending and interest. Health, it's, and when we say spending, let's be honest, it's mostly health care. One of the things we're not supposed to say out loud, but it is. When you actually, and this is a complex board, we should actually put it up. But here's where we are. And actually, one of the things that's fascinating with this is you're about to see interest in just a couple years exceed defense. So the interest payment uh, next year is three quarters of a trillion dollars. A couple years after that, the interest expenditure for this government will be more than defense. Then you keep looking, a couple years after that, exceeds non-defense discretionary. It'll be more money than that in a couple more years after that. And you start to get into 20 years from now, interest is more than Medicare. And yet Medicare is the primary driver of U.S. debt. And then at a certain point, it starts to exceed six and a half. 6.7% of the entire economy, of the entire economy, is just the debt payment of the United States. And this isn't conjectured. This is functionally built in. This is the um, you know, Committee for a Responsible Budget, their math, and I think their interest calculation is too low, but that's actually the chart we have. So understanding. You're not at the death spiral yet, but you're getting pretty darn close where healthcare costs go up substantially because we got 67 million baby boomers. And inflation, inflation has made all these bad, ugly predictions that weren't supposed to happen for years move forward. And now because of inflation, you have much higher interest rates because inflation is the devaluation of the dollar, so you gotta have a higher interest rate. And then the Federal Reserve trying to have higher interest rates to slow the economy down, particularly now wage inflation. Healthcare, inflation, interest rates. If we don't get in front of this, if we don't somehow get productivity up, if we somehow don't get investment capital to actually things that are productive. There's some fa fascinating articles last week about how it's amazing how many factories are being built around the United States with government money. And then the second paragraph is, of course, there's a problem. There's no consumers for the products they're about to make, and there's no workers for them. So I'll make you a prediction today, and I'll buy someone a fancy coffee if they remember this a couple years from now. We're going to have a whole bunch of government finance factories, because remember the soft nationalization that happened in the previous couple of years with Democrat control here. And we're going to have factories that basically run at a fraction a fraction of their capacity because they de can't find labor and there's functionally no consumers for their product. Remember, right now the world has a glut of computer chips. It was funny, as this place was passing the Chips Act a couple years ago, that same week or the week after that, The Economist magazine ran a front page or major article that basically said, hey, you do understand the economy is actually a wash in chips. They're just having a supply chain issue problem of delivery. But we believe in a, our, our brothers and sisters on the other side believe in a soft nationalization of major industries, and that's what happened. So let's actually walk through part of the rest of the crisis. And this isn't Republican or Democrat, it's demographics. We got old. We got old. It's not Republican, it's not demographics, it's just the way God made us. But here's what's happening. The Social Security Trust Fund, if you, this, this is from, I think using the number from the Medicare Social Security actuaries, but the CBO functionally has the trust fund gone in about nine years. Grandma having to take a 25% cut. But within here, so this one is Social Security, but you realize this right here, 2028, the Highway Trust Fund is gone. This one here, the Medicare trust fund. Now remember, Medicare, about 40% of Medicare spend comes from the trust fund. Um, the rest comes right out of the general fund. But that part is, is mostly the hospital portion. And it's gone. It's gone in about eight years. 
This is our reality. Um, what are we going to do? Are we just going to raise, are we going to raise how much taxes here? Then you're going to, how much taxes are you going to do to backshore the Medicare trust fund? Then, of course, the highway trust fund. If you start to stack all these requirements and then just the baseline deficit, the amount of the economy you'd have to now start collecting in taxes, you almost have to double. And I don't think there's an understanding of how bad the numbers and how fast the numbers are moving away from us. Look, this is just one of my fragility charts. It basically just says, look, if interest rates continue to stay are, uh, uh, uncomfortably high, there's some models out there, it basically say within the 30-year window, you hit points here where, um, and, and one of the best parts, calcs here, is if you had a 2% increase, and yes, you got to calculate it from this, if you had a 2% of it increase from interest rates that we had a year or two ago, and you held that for the 30 years, at about the 25th year, 100% of all tax receipts just go to interest. That's how, the, there's a concept of fragility, how on the edge we're living, and now we're starting to deal with it when inflation starts to shoot up healthcare costs and interest rates start to shoot up our caring. Did I mention three quarters of a trillion dollars next year in interest, and that's CBO's number, before the recent additional spike in interest rates. So, I brought this one just because I get this question, oh, but China owns our debt. Yeah. No, actually Japan is the number one holder of our debt. They hold about a trillion one. China has paired theirs back to eight and a half, 850 billion, and they continue to sell off U.S. treasuries or let them roll off. Um, this is the reality. Um, United Kingdom. Now, understand, United Kingdom holding U.S. Treasuries, they're often acting as a domicile for investors from other places in the world, so that number is often distorted, but that's 668. But the reality, much of the world has been slowly paring back their purchases of U.S. sovereigns. Think about that. It means much of this debt we have to finance internally it is the savings, it is your pension, it is the capital that we build up to grow the economy, to pay for your retirement, for your kids' college. Much of that now is being ultimately borrowed by the U.S. government. What happens when, at the end of the decade, they have to turn on the printing presses because they don't have enough buyers at an auction? Is it the rest of the world? Yeah, the rest of the world would probably go into recession, depression, we'd get wiped out. And look, I'm not one of those that believes it's a crash coming. It's more the rot that comes. You inflate the dollar, you inflate the dollar. People don't understand inflation. Inflating the dollar is a type of tax. We devalue your savings, and then the value of the debt actually gets paid back with inflated dollars. So it becomes a transfer of your wealth, it becomes a transfer of your wealth to government. That's the really sneaky, sneaky evil of inflation. It's actually a wealth transfer. It's a tax. Last couple of years have been one of the biggest taxes in modern history. People don't know it. And we've made America poor. I mean, if you want to know why the working middle class, why the working, you know, the, the, the working poor are really cranky, they're poorer today than they were a couple of years ago. It's inflation. Their wages haven't gone up as fast. So, I, I do this chart just to basically beat up my own side um, and sort of make a point. If you do a baseline number, now here's one of the great scams going on right now in budgeting. We're taking along, economy is growing phenomenally well, the poor are getting less poor, really good things, income inequality shrinking, some of the greatest sh shrinkage of food insecurity. So the two, late 2017 tax reform happens, and we have this remarkable growth with no inflation. Pandemic hits. Spending goes way up. And now we're actually starting to rebuild our budgets 
but we're often using the inflated base from the pandemic. So the way you actually look at honest math is pick a benchmark year. Go, go back a decade, go back two decades, go back three decades, it doesn't matter. And then just pick a date and then say, here's the budget and we're gonna inflation adjust it. How much would today's, the 22 budget be if we just inflation adjust it? How much higher would this be than the baseline? Simple? Eh. Non-defense discretionary is up 154%, defense is up 35%. So when someone tells you saying, well, Discretionary spending is pretty flat. It's flat from the last couple of years, which were dramatically higher. But if you see the chart, I know this is uncomfortable and that, that I'm not making a lot of friends by sharing this, but the reality of it is non-defense discretionary is up dramatically from its inflation adjusted trend line. It just, it's math. It is the truth. So let's have a little more fun here. And this is my one shot at inflation, well, actually two shots at inflation, I have another board, to understand, and I do need to update from um, the unemployment number from a couple, what was it, the end of last week, that actually had some pretty good wage growth in it. So this number may shrink a, a fraction of a fraction, but that was actually positive to see. But if you want to understand why much of the population is cranky right now, it's because they're poorer. Look, under President Obama, real wage, let's, let's phrase it the right way, percentage change in real averagely, average week, work, <laughs> weekly earnings. Okay, so this is for production type workers. This is for our brothers and sisters, the classic middle class sliver. Um, the BLS gives us a great data set here. Under Obama, over that time, you had about a 4% growth in real wages, adjusted for inflation. Under President Trump, it was 9.8. It was a remarkable growth in real wages adjusted for inflation. But so far, at this moment, under this administration, you're 3.5% poorer. It's just math. And, and much of this is wages are up, but inflation's up more. Just is what it is. And there's another way to calculate it that if you actually look at it, go back to the BLS numbers, um, you know, if you look at the change in real disposable personal income per capita, so now you adjust it per person, today the average working American is 4.5% poor. You feel that. I'll also argue it's immoral. We should fi fixate it. And transfer payments aren't a fix. It's a Band-Aid that ends up making the wound worse. But that's actually been the solutions that keep being offered around here. So back to something that's really uncomfortable to talk about. But there's a reason for pulling this chart right now. This chart now is almost two years old. Numbers are much worse. Over the next 30 years, we no longer expect about $116 trillion of borrowing. We now expect it closer to 130 trillion. And if you want to tell the truth about it, three quarters of the borrowing is Medicare, one quarter is Social Security. And that's if we choose to backfill Social Security, which you already know the moral dilemma we're walking into, 25% cut. And we had a president stand behind that podium and made it almost toxic for my brothers on the left and our folks on our side to have an actual honest conversation about the math because it's a great campaign issue because the public doesn't understand it. But the math basically said the rest of the budget's in balance because this is where all the demographic growth is. This coming year, remember how many times you've heard people say 10,000 Americans turn 65 every day? In 2024, it's 12,000 Americans turn 65 every day. For those of you with a calculator, take that 12,000, multiply it by 365. And that's just the new additions to the Medicare rules. And you start to understand the math. So let's have a little more fun here. So, I often end up with discussions when I do certain groups, things at home, and say, well, you know, tax rich people more. 
Okay, fine. A point of reference. So our brothers and sisters on the left, the president have said, people who make $400,000 and below will not be touched. Okay. $400,000 and up is 2% of the population. And most of them live in Democrat districts. So maybe as Republicans, we should stop caring. They live on the coasts. Most of that population lives in Democrat districts, but fine, it's your voters. But it's only 2% of the population. You actually believe when we're projected to have, what, a $2.5, $2.6 trillion a year borrowing at the end of the 10-year window? So nine years, nine budget years from now, the annual borrowing will be over $2.5 trillion a year. And that's CBO's number from, I think, the, from last week, and I think it underestimates interest costs. You're going to finance that on 2% of the population. Okay, let's walk through why that's mathematically doesn't work. Now, why this board is important, it's a distribution, share of individual income versus share of federal income tax. What's fascinating is upper income, if you start to look here, take the populations that are $100,000 and up. They pay the vast majority of income tax. Now, look, they have very high percentages of the share of income until you get to the really wealthy. So functionally here, if you can see this blue line here, that's the percentage of total income. And this is the amount of taxes they're paying. So if you're one of the people who makes a million dollars, which I'd like to meet a few of them, I'd like to become their friends, but functionally, the percentage of the total federal income tax they pay compared to others is like two and a half times more. Bit of trivia, and I dare anyone to walk up to someone from the left and just ask them this question. After the 2017 tax reform, was the U.S. federal income tax more or less progressive? Trivia answer. The tax model got more progressive, meaning the wealthier were paying a higher percentage of federal income taxes after tax reform than before it, and half the, work, half the population was removed from the tax rolls. But how often will you have anyone actually tell the truth about that? So let's walk through just a couple more of these boards. Um, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, may I ask on my time? The gentleman has 27 minutes remaining. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. And to my friends who have the next time slot, I promise I'll even talk faster. I just, I have a series of boards. I may save these for another week, but it just sort of talks about some of the spending that happened last year. Do you remember when we were getting the Inflation Reduction Act, which, come on, let's be all honest, was a completely Orwellian name for something that actually boosted inflation. Um, but where the spending was, well, remember, we were first told, oh, it's going to be a couple hundred billion, maybe $280 billion of handouts to big green energy for energy companies that do things we want. Then um, we saw Goldman Sachs say, nah, it could be as high as $1 trillion, $200 billion. This one actually has the latest data at about $659 billion. So you want to know, understand why inflation's continuing? Why there's factories being built that are going to be empty? Um, you know, it's the ultimate Keynesian economics without actually demand on the other side and without, you know, so build the factory, but then don't build the mechanisms to actually have supply. It's just, this is what happens with the arrogance of us who sit in this body thinking we can manage the economy. So let's have a little fun here. And I'm going to be a little caustic on some of these. I'm, I know I'm going to be slightly mean, but I'm just trying to get it through. So let's actually walk through a couple of these proposals. Let's repeal all of the 2017 tax reform cuts, including also what we did for low-income folks, you know, the doubling of deductions and those things. Over the 10 years, remember, in 10 years from now, we are borrowing about $2.5 trillion a year. Over the whole 10 years, we get about $455 billion in. Over 10 years. 
So next time you have a Democrat behind a microphone going, you know, it's the tax reform. Okay, so just repeal it. And when you take away the growth effects, the wage growth effects, look at the number. You get $455 billion of receipts over an entire 10 years. So let's actually walk through a couple of the other things going on. Proposal, a 30% minimum Buffett tax. How many of you have ever heard the Buffett? Because remember, we tax income different than passive incomes, pass, uh, capital gains, those things. Okay, how many people have gotten behind the microphone on that side and said, it's not fair? Maybe it isn't. Rewrite the 16th Amendment. But get, go to a 30% under that Buffett rule where everyone's paying. It produces $66 billion over 10 years, or 0 0.03, if I can do my three, percent of GDP. Remember, we're heading towards borrowing 7.5, something much more percent of the entire economy in borrowing, but this would take care of 0 0.03. It's theater. It's not real math. But those are the types of proposals this place likes because they politically poll well, but it's crap math. So let's do a little more of some of the proposals the other side gives. Eliminate all itemized tax deductions. Okay. $1.7 billion over the 10. Excuse me, sorry, I knew I was getting that wrong. $1 trillion, $718 billion over the 10 years. That's real money, except you saw some of the boards that if you're borrowing two and a half trillion a year, and I get it 1.7 trillion over 10, so about 170 billion dollars of tax receipts by getting rid of all deductions. Okay, but this is a Democrat proposal. It's real money, but it's nothing. I mean, it's just still almost nothing compared to the scale of the borrowing. Remember, we borrowed two trillion dollars in the last 12 months. So let's take another proposal here. Raise the FICA cap. Just get rid of the cap. Now maybe there's part of this we should have a debate over. But don't think it solves all the problems. It's more complicated. And this is what breaks my heart is I actually think letting Social Security Trust Fund run out of money is immoral on all of our parts. But we're terrified to talk about it because you'll lose your election if you do. I'm an idiot, I talk about it. So you get rid of the FICA cap. Over the 10 years, it produces 2.18 trillion. Okay, doesn't get you there, doesn't get you there. I think this, if you remove the caps and you can keep the current benefit formula, it takes care of only 19% of the shortfall. So you gotta decide, you're gonna get you're going to be taxed on every dime with the 15.3% FICA tax, and you're, if you're going to give people the same formula benefits, you're only covering about 19% of the shortfall. But that's one of the big talking points on the left is raise the cap, okay. But don't pretend it actually takes care of the problem of saving Social Security. 2022 tax revenues were $1 trillion of pre-pandemic levels. Now, understand, lots of pandemic spending in this and those things, but do understand, it's a trillion, a trillion. So you went from three, seven to four, eight trillion dollars, a trillion dollar growth. It's like, you know, 20%, 25% growth in tax receipts, pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. And yet, somehow we're still burning through it. So go back to a couple of the other proposals. How about a 50% income tax rate on everyone, $200,000 and up? Okay, take everyone $200,000 and up, you get a 50% federal income tax. Now on top of that, put on your FICA, put on your state and local taxes, okay? You basically, 1.59, it actually should be trillion, or 0.45% of the economy in additional taxes. So we're heading towards a time where we're going to be borrowing 7.5%. That's CBO's number. That's the more, most conservative number. Seven, let's call it 7, 7.5. 7 
and this does less than a half a percent, going to 50% income tax rate on everyone over $200,000. Can't pretend that raising these taxes gets you close to the numbers that are necessary. A couple more boards and then I will shut up. Taxing 100% of all income over $500,000 would balance the budget over the decade. No! And I can show you a dozen members who've said those things behind these microphones. We just need to tax 100%. Take those rich people, make $500,000 and up, and just tax everything additional. It would raise about 5.1% of the economy, assuming you don't slow the economy down. So remember, these are static scores. These are not dynamic. So you take everyone that makes over a half a million dollars, fine. Take every dime of income, and then pretend the economy does not crash on you, doesn't slow down, the economy stays the same. You get about 5.1% of the economy in taxes. You're borrowing seven and a half. Okay, so you closed a bunch of the gap. Now, it's also fantasy that you didn't just blow up the economy. So let's do a couple of the other fantasies. Raise corporate tax, income tax, to 20, from 21% to 35%. Okay, you get 1.39 trillion over 10. So you get about another $130 billion a year. Did I mention we borrowed $2 trillion in the last 12 months? But you could go to a 35% corporate income tax, make us not competitive in the world. And remember, corporate income taxes are just passed to you as the consumer. But it makes us feel better. Look, we have lists of the different proposals our brothers and sisters on the left have given. And look, maybe there is a need for fixing parts of the tax code. Fine, I believe tax codes are living documents because we have to compete with the rest of the world, which is also always changing. But to live in the fantasy world that just raising a handful of these taxes gets you anywhere, it's just not true. So just as we have some people on our side, if we get rid of foreign aid, we can balance the budget. It's 12 days of borrowing. We've got to have our brothers and sisters on the other side stop pretending, if we just tax rich people more, we'll balance the budget. It's not true. We all know it's not true. Do we care so much more about not telling our voters the truth because they might not love us anymore? <laughs> Guess what? They don't love us anyway. But the math is the math. Um, we have a demographic problem in this country. And you take a look at where we're at. Think of that. The Social Security Trust Fund, at the end of last year, the very end of last year, held $2.7 trillion. And that is gone in functioning nine years helps you understand the burn rate. So 75% of what goes out in Social Security is functionally what comes in on the FICA tax. The 25% is what goes out from the trust fund. And we're gonna, that 25% is gonna chew up $2.7 trillion over the next nine years. And most of these trust funds are gone by the end of this decade. What do we plan to do? What do we plan to do? Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, I typically, when I do these, I try to come to the end and talk about what we could do with diabetes and obesity and health and making our society healthier and the effects that would have on balancing the budget. But I've just grown so weary of you do these presentations to show the crashing of our window of opportunity, the scale of the growth of debt. Remember, we borrowed $63,000 a second in the last 12 months, and then you get these idiots that go, what? You could just raise this guy's taxes, we'll be fine. It may make you feel better. You may not like people who earn money, fine, you're allowed to do that, but don't pretend it actually solves the problems. Complex problems require complex solutions. And Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, I worry this place isn't capable of complexity anymore. And with that, I yield back.